Hi, my name is Linnea and I am so excited to get to take you through our next psalm as we consider what it means to pray through creation. In case you don't know me, and there's a good chance you don't, I originally grew up in Southern California and I started attending FCCH the summer after my freshman year at Gordon College. I volunteer with our high school ministry and I just started in the counseling program at uh, Gordon-Conwell and I'm loving it so far. When I was a student at Gordon, I volunteered with the ministry La Vida, which many of you are familiar with, I would assume, but in case you're not, it's Gordon's outdoor education and leadership development ministry started by our very own Rich Obenchain. Uh, through La Vida, I spent a lot of my summers leading backpacking trips for college students and high school students in upstate New York. One of the unique experiences that students on a La Vida backpacking trip get to have is called bushwhacking. And they usually leave the trip saying they never want to do it again. But for those of you not familiar with bushwhacking, uh, it involves you leaving the trail intentionally uh, and forging your own path through the wilderness uh, based on a map and compass. Usually it's done to cut down mileage, but it's helpful because if you ever find yourself lost in the woods, you can use the same skills learned through bushwhacking to reorient yourself and get back to the trail. Uh, in order to do that successfully, if you ever find yourself lost, you need to figure out your position first, which is done uh, by using various landmarks around you. So if you're doing this at night, you might use the stars. If you're doing this during the day, you might find a far off mountain range or a body of water nearby. And once you figure out your position, you can use a map and compass properly uh, to fulfill your purpose, which typically is to get back to the trail or sometimes to get to a campsite. Interestingly, we see a similar pattern exhibited by David in Psalm 8. The Psalm opens by declaring, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Right away, we are clued into the fact that this Psalm is about God and his glory. And how special is it that we get to say our God to the one whose glory is above even the heavens. The psalm continues, out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. As I was reading through Psalm 8 the first couple of times, this verse seemed a little out of place to me. Why does David include this bit by describing God as establishing his strength through the mouths of babies and infants, people that can't speak for themselves, the psalmist sets up a contrast between those dependent on God and those who trust in their own strength, just like we've seen in Psalms 1 and 2. And as Christians, being called children isn't a new concept to us. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he in you than he that is in the world. It is not about how strong we are, but the strength and power of Christ in us. David is highlighting the power is God's and not our own which becomes abundantly clear as the psalm continues. As the psalm continues, David says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have put in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? 
These are the verses I am personally most familiar with. Maybe you resonate with that. And there are a few things that I love about them. David looks at creation and he immediately draws a connection to their creator. I think I can sometimes get caught up in nature itself when I'm on a hike or just outside. Um, I'll notice a flower and marvel over the delicacy and intricacy, or I'll look at a sunset and take a hundred photos and send them to my mom. Um, but I often forget to whom they point. And David doesn't make that mistake here. He immediately attributes what he's seeing to his God. Not only that, but I love that he describes the heavens as works of God's fingers. How powerful must God be in order to create the universe and set the stars in place with his fingers? It's no wonder that with this view of God, looking at the night sky makes David feel small and insignificant and overwhelmed that God cares for him. If you've ever looked at the night sky, you've probably felt at least a sliver of what David's feeling too. It's not hard to look at the moon and stars and not feel small. What I love about David's response is that he understands God's character as abounding in love as much as he is powerful, which allows David to understand his own identity as one cared for by God. If David wasn't familiar with God's character, if he didn't know God, looking at the night sky might have been terrifying. I'm so insignificant and there's nothing to keep me from being struck down at any moment. Or he may have missed the point altogether. But because he is familiar with who God is, he knows that he is cared for and this sets the foundation for understanding his position in relationship to God. David continues, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. David understands that the position God has put him in, and not just him, but all of humanity, is wildly out of place. To be made a little lower than heavenly beings is to be made a little lower than God himself, which for one so seemingly insignificant is an indes indescribable honor and not one a place of little significance would expect himself to be in. And that is the radical story of the gospel that I love so much, that we who did not deserve to be treated with mercy and grace and honor were given it in abundance. By taking in his surroundings, by looking at the stars, David finds himself pondering about his position in relationship to God and how he doesn't really think he should be there. David goes on to articulate the role God has given humanity and his position in relation to the rest of creation. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Not only is he positioned a little lower than the heavenly beings, David is given dominion, humanity is given dominion over the work of God's hands, all of creation, just as God ordains in Genesis 1:26. With my different backpacking groups, I often talk about what it means to have dominion over creation. Does this mean that we can go around leaving our trash everywhere and pushing trees over to create the perfect tent spot? Does it mean we can go around taking advantage of resources and doing what we want without any care for creation? Of course not. We recognize that there is a responsibility to care for those that are subject to us. And David understands this too, that in understanding his position in God's creation as both a little bit lower than the heavenly beings and over all of creation, David also understands his purpose 
in this case, to steward or rule over creation. At this point, David returns to his original statement, except now there's context for why this statement is so true. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. At the end of the psalm, we now see what David was pondering when he first set about to write down those words. And we see that creation is what sparked this pondering. The beauty in reading Psalm 8 is that we are invited to join the psalmist, to join David in recognizing the glory of the Lord through creation ourselves. And we're invited to join David in glorifying him ourselves, glorifying God. If you're not particularly inclined to spend time outside, you may be asking, what's the significance of spending time in nature? Can't I just acknowledge the glory of God from inside the comfort of my own home? I can see the snow outside. And I think C.S. Lewis has a particularly apt answer. He says this about prayer. The body ought to pray as well as the soul. Body and soul are both better for it. And but for our body, one whole realm of God's glory all that we receive through our senses would go unpraised. For the beasts can't appreciate it, and the angels are, I suppose, pure intelligences. They understand colors and tastes better than any of our greatest scientists. But have they retinas or palettes? I fancy that the beauties of nature are a secret God has shared with us alone. That may be one of the reasons why we were made and why the resurrection of the body is an important doctrine. We are not simply souls. We are created beings, embodied beings, and we live in a world full of created things that all point back to their creator, our creator. To utilize creation, to look at the stars or trees or sunsets or snow and recognize the creativity and power of the one who made it all is to draw us into a deeper appreciation for and awe of our God. And it helps us to, and it helps to orient us to our place in and purpose in his kingdom. By spending time in creation, we tangibly experience the creativity and glory of our God and we're reminded of who and where we are in his kingdom. Just as with my students, when I'm first teaching them how to bushwhack, by looking at our surroundings, by looking at creation, we are reminded of our position. And when we understand our position, we can move confidently forward in our purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are God and we are not. We are thankful for your creativity and we are so thankful for the role and position you've given us in caring for your creation. We pray that you open our eyes this week as we spend time in creation to better understand and more fully see your glory through the created world around us. And we pray you bless us as we head into this week. In your name, amen. Thanks, guys.